Okay, um, everybody, I think we'll get started. Thank you for coming back to the afternoon session um, of our bioinformatics and open source mini conference. This afternoon, we have kicking us off um, Alan Rubin. Alan's uh, coming to us from Melbourne, where he's a postdoc at the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, um, studying a wide range of interesting topics in bioinformatics. And um, before that, he was in uh, Seattle in the US, uh, where he did um, a PhD with Bill Green. Um, so uh, today, Alan's going to tell us about how mutagenesis can help us understand protein function, and surely something about software we can use to do that. Thank you, Alan. All right. Thanks, Aaron, and uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, so yeah, so today I'm going to talk about using mutagenesis to understand protein function. I will tell you both about what mutagenesis is and why protein function is important. Um, but first, uh, I mean, we're here at the bioinformatics mini-conf, and uh, I'm in a bioinformatics division. Uh, and so I thought I'd talk a little bit about bioinformatics research. Uh, so bioinformatics research is highly interdisciplinary. I think it, most people agree that it's composed of uh, kind of a combination of uh, computer science, uh, biology, or some kind of sort of life sciences, and statistics. And most people in the field have um, a sort of mastery of, of two out of three of these. And so we can, if we put, uh, if we look at the intersections of each of these three fields, I'd say um, the intersection of biology and computer science is what we call computational biology. Uh, computer science statistics would be data science. Biology and statistics would be biostatistics. Um, pretty much everyone who identifies as a bioinformatics researcher, genomics researcher, has uh, mastery of two out of three, but not all of them. Almost nobody really has all three of these figured out. Um, so that's why we all work together. Um, and so for, my, for myself, I certainly identify as a computational biologist. So that's the perspective that I'm going to be uh, talking to you from today. Um, so, and my, my PhD is actually in, in genomics from a sort of interdisciplinary uh, kind of a department. So we're talking about proteins, so what are proteins? Uh, we just finished lunch. Sometimes when people think of protein, they think of something like this. Uh, that is not what I mean when I say protein. Uh, what I mean is something like this. So uh, proteins in this context are biological molecules. They're a polymer composed of amino acids. Uh, this is a cartoon representation of a protein. So these polymers, they're a single chain that can contain anywhere from about 20 to about 33,000 amino acids, all chained up in a row. And uh, when we uh, look at the protein structures, um, we sometimes draw them in, in one of these cartoon forms, which is called a ribbon diagram, uh, for reasons that I hope are obvious when you look at the structure. Um, this is myoglobin, which is a protein that carries oxygen in the blood. Uh, so the blue ribbon is showing the, uh, the, the structure of the protein, so how the backbone kind of winds around after the protein folds up to perform its function. Uh, sometimes there are extra little bits associated with the protein, so there's that little ball and stick uh, structure there. That's the heme group that has the iron in it, and then the little red balls are the oxygen that it's coordinating. So it's a lot easier to look at this than to look at a cartoon like this than to look at raw data. So I, when I show you protein structures and things like that, they're going to be in this idealized form. So proteins are important because they're responsible for most cellular functions. They're what really sort of do all the work that do metabolism. They um, read and, and write DNA. Um, and they're encoded by genes. So more specifically, what I mean by that is that DNA encodes proteins. So you have DNA, which is the structure um, on the, your right, uh, and then that gets transcribed into RNA, and then that RNA gets translated into protein. Um, so rather than try to give you a lot of jargon about exactly how this process works and have you um, keep that in your head for the rest of this um, kind of background section, uh, I think instead uh, we'll use an analogy. So we'll, we'll use rocket science analogy um, to explain this. So if you have, D so your DNA is basically like the master copy of the blueprint that you keep in a safe somewhere uh, where it's out of harm's way. The RNA is a temporary copy that you make that you can send out to the machine shop or the factory floor and use it to make something. And the thing that we want to make is the thing that's actually going to do whatever it is that we're doing. In this case, we're going to make a rocket, and the rocket is going to lift off and go into space. Now, 
Proteins are not just rockets. They do all kinds of different things inside the cell. So I showed you myoglobin, which carries oxygen inside the cell. Um, they're also involved in capturing energy in the mitochondria. So the powerhouse of the cell is totally powered by proteins. Um, they survey the genome and identify DNA damage and can block uh, the formation of a tumor. So that's the P53 in the middle. It's a very well-studied cancer gene. Uh, they can turn other genes on and off. And they can also, um, by binding to DNA, and they can also turn other proteins on and off by chemically modifying other proteins. So really, all of the biological processes that are happening at the cellular level are mediated by proteins. And so that's why we want to understand them. And so it's no surprise, then, that uh, most genetic research focuses on protein coding genes. Part of that is because that's the part of the genome that we have the most information about and are most able to interpret. Um, but probably as a direct result of that, and because of their importance in physiology, almost all clinical drug targets are proteins. And in fact, about 50% of drug targets are a specific class of protein called a G-protein coupled receptor because it sits on the outside of the cell, and so it's easier to get drugs to it. Um, so I, I hope that I've convinced you that it's really, really important to understand proteins and to understand what proteins are doing so that we can understand both basic biology and so that we can understand um, disease states. So one way that we can, so what we want to do is, is, of course, understand proteins. So we want to understand how the rocket works. We can see that the rocket works, and we can see the blueprint of the rocket, but we, maybe we don't know exactly what, what bit does what. Um, so we want to understand which parts of the protein are important, and we want to understand what they do. And so one approach and the uh, way that I look at this problem is uh, we want to understand it in terms of sequence function relationships. And what I mean by that is that uh, every protein has a sequence. It's made up of a sequence of amino acids. That sequence of amino acids, that chain folds up into some shape. Um, and that shape is the protein structure. So the sequence of amino acids is determined by the sequence of DNA. And that sequence of amino acids determines the structure of the protein, how the protein folds up. And that structure of the protein, what shape it is, determines its function. So if it's a protein that is going to need to bind to DNA, it needs to be the right shape to be able to bind to DNA or to a specific DNA sequence. Or if it's going to bind to another protein, it needs to be the right shape to bind to that other protein. Or if it's part of the immune system and is going to recognize some virus that's, that's in the body, it needs to be the right shape to recognize that virus and then also have the right shape on it to be able to signal to the rest of the immune system. So, and, and the, the core point here is that if you change the sequence, you can change the function of the protein because it's all about um, this, this relationship here. And so one of the ways that we can approach this problem is by using a, a set of techniques uh, which we'll call mutational analysis. And so we have our protein. And what mutational analysis is, it's a, essentially a fancy way of saying we're going to break it and we're going to see what happens. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a mutation. So the lightning bolt is a sort of universal symbol in biology for making a mutation. So we're going to zap it. And then something's going to happen. And maybe now the rocket's not going to launch. So that would tell us that if we zap that part, that maybe this, this is one of the outcomes. So to bring it back to the DNA and the RNA and the protein, what we can do is we can go to the DNA and we can make a mutation. We can make a change in the DNA. That change in the DNA is going to be faithfully copied into the RNA. And then that change in the RNA is potentially going to affect the protein uh, that gets made. And it may stop our rocket from launching, or it may not. And it may cause some other change, or it may cause no really meaningful change at all. And that's what we want to be able to figure out. So we can make these mutants we can cha by changing the DNA sequence. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, we can change the DNA sequence, and, um, and that'll change the protein sequence. The good news here is that changing the DNA sequence is really pretty easy. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, yes, we can use CRISPR to do it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other ways to do it. Um, it gets into a lot of molecular biology that I, don't, that I don't have slides to go into, but I'm happy to take questions about if you're curious. 
Um, the bad news is, is that if you have, uh, is that if you want to make a whole bunch of these mutants to test a whole bunch of these mutants, uh, making a lot of them individually is really costly and slow. So we needed some kind of technological breakthrough to, uh, to get us past this hurdle. And so um, that came in the form of a new experimental technique called deep mutational scanning. So this is an experimental technique that puts together uh, molecular biology, uh, biochemistry, and uh, genomics and genome sequencing. So basically what we do is we're going to start with uh, a protein coding gene of interest where we want to know what all the different mutations are going to do. And we make a whole bunch of mutations. So here in this cartoon, I have um, the black DNA molecule, which is the unmutated or wild type, like, in the, like found in the wild. So this is the wild type version of the DNA molecule. We have a red one and a green one, and we have a blue one, and they're all present in this population of, of, of our, our variants, our mutants. Now we can take these DNA molecules and put them into cells and perform some kind of an experimental assay. And what that assay is going to do is it's going to ha put the cells uh, with all these different variant DNA molecules, it's going to put them in a competition with each other to see who can grow best. And so if that variant is able to function, then it's going to grow. And if it's not, then it won't. And if they're able to grow or, or grow better or worse at different rates, uh, we're going to be able to see that uh, quantitatively. So in this example, we have um, after our selection, so we have our, in the top, we have the, uh, that's um, the population that we started with. And then we go down to our selected population. And we can see that it looks like the red one was like really pretty good. Uh, the blue one was pretty bad. And the green one and the, and the green one was about the same as, as the wild type, the black one. So it, the green mutation didn't really have that much effect. Now, at this point in the experiment, we, maybe we have an idea of, what's in, of what mutants we made, but we have no idea what's in the cells. Like, you can't look at them, and even if you could look at them, you don't want to because you don't want to count, like, millions of cells in the microscope. So instead, we use high-throughput sequencing to take a sample of what's in each of these populations and use the sequencing instrument as a way of counting what's in those populations. So again, because the changes that are made in the protein are based on the change that exists in the DNA sequence. So if we sequence the DNA, which is relatively easy to do, we can get a sense of uh, the frequencies of all these different um, cells that contain our mutant protein. Uh, once we've done that, uh, we can count all of these different molecules. And then it becomes kind of a big data problem, because we've got a bunch of counts. And nobody really wants to look at counts. What they want to look at are scores. And specifically, they want to look at scores that say, is this mutant that I made better or worse than what I started with? And so to do that, we use software and statistics. And I'm going to tell you about the approach that, um, that I've led and the software that I've written in order to do this. Um, so the software package is called Enrich2. Uh, it is user-friendly software for biologists. So a lot of. Um, a lot of bioinformatics tools are command line based or they're sort of console based. Like R is relatively user friendly, but it's still very much like a command line kind of experience. If you go to someone who has the expertise to do one of these deep mutational scanning experiments, so to make, the, the make all the mutants, develop the assay, transform the cells, Perform, that, perform all of that complicated molecular biology and biochemistry, uh, they usually are not also going to want to have to open up a shell and build your tool from source and do all of that kind of stuff. So in order to make it useful to the people who need it, what we really wanted to do was have some user-friendly software. Um, so it has a few different pieces here. So uh, there's a part up here where, where the user can specify the experimental design. So you can have, um, you can do multiple different experiments with different, you, you can and should do multiple replicates. And so there's a lot of structure that needs to go in there. And we want people to be able to analyze all their data at once. So they can do that through kind of point and click. Um, 
There's a lot of file handling and filtering options for dealing with the DNA sequence files themselves. And then, of course, there's a bunch of analysis and scoring options. Um, so behind the scenes, what this is actually doing is um, building a really big JSON file uh, that specifies the experimental structure and all of the options. And when I started the project, um, I built this really nice tool, and it consumed this JSON file. And I gave it to one of my uh, close collaborators. And she was like, are you kidding me? Like, I'm not hand editing this JSON file. Like, this is, you're, this is insane. So, um, so that, this was sort of built out of, out of that need to, to have some way for people to easily um, communicate with the software. And now uh, the, the GUI runs the entire thing. There's a command line implementation for people that want to use it in HPC. But uh, most people don't use that. I don't use that version. Um, so it's Python software. It uses everyone's favorite um, scientific Python libraries. Uh, none of this would be possible without all of these libraries. So if you've ever contributed to one of these libraries, thank you very much. Um, it runs mostly on top of pandas, which interfaces with PyTables, which uh, connects to HDF5 files. So HDF5 was really a nice technology to use um, for this project because uh, it allows us to store in a relatively compact and structured and indexed format all of the intermediate versions of, of the data. So when we're calculating scores, you know, we start with counts, and then maybe we turn those, turn those into log counts, and then we have a log ratio, and then we you know, do some other stuff, and we do regression and things like that. But we want to be able to go back to any point during that process and say, well, before we did this transformation, what did we have? And that's really important for developing new scoring methods that may be better, especially for new experimental designs. And that's also really important um, for debugging. And so it's nice to be able to kind of have everything in a, in a, in a, stable, um, in a stable format. It also ended up really massively reducing the memory footprint of the software, which ends up being really important. Now, there's a GitHub link at the bottom if you want to go and look at it. Um, so here's an example of a real data set. This data set's actually three years old now. So the new data sets are bigger than this data set. Um, but this is still a pretty big one. Um, so it was a deep mutational scan of BRCA1, which you may have heard of as a gene um, involved in hereditary breast cancer. Uh, so this was a, a scan of just one region of, of BRCA1, because um, BRCA1 is a really big protein. But it was 68 sequencing experiments. I have all these files here. And there's, there are 68 of them showing that we had you know, 68 sequencing experiments. We had 68 sequencing files, uh, which amounted to 235 gigabytes of sequence data. So it's mostly, these sequence files are mostly stored in text format. It's called FASTQ format, but it's basically text. Um, there were over a billion sequences in these, and uh, that there were over 250,000 different data points. And so by data points, I really mean variants, so mutants that we're tracking through, through the analysis. And so running on this now relatively old 2013 MacBook Pro, it took 17 hours of runtime and, oh, and four gigs of peak memory. And most of that time is just I.O., just reading these, you know, 235 gigs worth of text data, which we actually, it's kind of cheating because we actually compress it and read the compressed files, but it's still a lot. Um, so I think that, I mean, we're going to hear uh, in the next talks about some really uh, awesome uh, cloud-based um, and web-based stuff, but I think that it's, it's important to remember that even as people talk about, you know, biology is big data, the data is massive, it's overwhelming, we need all this compute like in the cloud or in HPC and things like that. There are still a lot of use cases where you just want to run it on your laptop because I don't want you to send that to my server and have me spend, you know, even if I can do it in half the time on the server, and then have to send the result back to you. Like it's much better to just have it all be local, have it be a desktop app, and just have it run. So I think it's it's important to um, to keep that in mind, that, that there are still a lot of use cases where, where doing things locally is, is better. Um, so we're pretty far into this talk, and I haven't shown you any data yet. 
So I'm going to show you some data. So this is what it actually looks like. So this is not BRCA1. This is a different protein. This is a protein, uh, protein do a short protein domain, because I want to be able to fit it nicely on a slide. Um, it's called a WW domain. But what you're looking at is what we call a sequence function map. And it's one of the main ways in which we visualize the data. So uh, in this figure, all of the columns are positions in the, in the protein uh, that we mutated. And all of the rows are different amino acids that you could mutate to. And um, what's really nice about this sort of high-level visualization is that if you show this to someone who's an expert in a particular protein, they see all kinds of interesting patterns in it. And they can pick out things that were known in the literature before and things that, they, that are related to other things that are known in the literature. Um, and they can find all kinds of interesting patterns but we can find some interesting patterns too. So just to walk you through a little bit more of, of exactly what's going on. So across the top is um, the wild type sequence. So that's the sequence that we started with. We can just read it off. Those are all the single letter amino acid codes. And the position numbers are across the bottom. The amino acid uh, rows are organized based on the chemical properties of the amino acids. So ones that are similar are next to each other. Um, the dots are where that's the wild type position, so you can't mutate to the wild type, you can't mutate to what you already had. Uh, gray boxes are where we have missing data, so we didn't actually see that variant in the experiment. And then the, the boxes are otherwise colored by their score, where red is um, a higher score than wild type, which means that it did better in the assay. And blue is worse than wild type, which means that it did worse in the assay. And some of them have these little bar, diagonal bars. Uh, those are estimates of experimental error. If there's no error estimate, that just means the error was less than 5% of the maximum error. And so you can't draw a bar. Um, so we can find some interesting patterns in here as well. Um, so the first thing that we can, that we can look at is that uh, is that if you, on the bottom here, this is what happens if you put a premature termination codon, so a stop codon. So if you truncate the protein, it's, it's not good. So this ass, actual assay is a, is a binding assay, so it's this, this short protein domain binds to a different protein, and what we're testing for is can it bind. So if you cut off half of the thing, half of the protein that's supposed to bind the other protein, it doesn't bind very well. That's great to see. It means that our assay is like at least kind of working. Um, it's sort of a positive control. So this is the WW domain, and it's called a WW domain because it has these two Ws, these two tryptophan residues in it, always. There are many, many different kinds of WW domains found all throughout eukaryotes in all kinds of different proteins. They always have the WW. If you get rid of one of the Ws, it can't bind its partner anymore um, in other sort of uh, kind of positive control sort of thing we might like to see. But there are some other things that are a little bit more interesting. So for example, this 25th position in this specific WW domain seems really suboptimal. Uh, because if you change it to just about anything else, it improves the binding. So all these, all these guys are, are lighting up red. Um, we can also look at similar amino acids, where these are two positively charged amino acids. And they tend to behave similarly, as one might expect. If you swap in one positively charged amino acid or another positively charged amino acid, you're still adding a positive charge to a specific spot on the protein. So it kind of makes sense that these would behave similarly. But of course, since it's biology, there's always kind of weird exceptions, like this one, um, that, that might be interesting to follow up. Um, so. This is far from the only, uh, the only tool that does this, this, kind of, this kind of work. So there's a lot of methods, uh, and there's a lot of data formats. And um, so looking at this and trying to compare um, data sets from different groups, trying to do some kind of meta-analysis stuff, uh, motivated um, the next project that I'm going to tell you about in the last few minutes here. Um, so on the top. This is, so there's four different um, files that I got from published papers. So on the top, this is basically like the um, sequence function map that I just showed you, only in table form and uh, transposed. So we have 
the different position and the wild type residue and then what you mutated it to and then some kind of score. Um, the one on the middle right is uh, they have this, their own nomenclature for defining the, the mutants. So they have multiple mutants here. So they, it's a comma separated list of positions and then a comma separated list of amino acids. There's no other context here if you want to know what else is going on in that sequence, you have to go back to the original wild type sequence that you have somewhere else in another file and kind of figure that out. Um, and then they have some other, you know, different kinds of scores. Um, here's another one where you, they just show the position and the amino acid and then the scores and, and um, some other values in a variety of different experimental conditions. And the bottom one is one of mine, which uses this sort of kind of messy looking with a lot of parentheses format, but it's the standard format for um, human genomic variation, variant data. So there, there are some packages out there to sort of parse it and people in the um, human genomics and human genetics community who are familiar with this format. So I didn't want to write my own new format when I didn't have to, because I think, and I think that's something that as a field sometimes we struggle with, as you can see, based on that first one or that, that middle one. Um, so looking at this kind of mess um, and looking at how difficult it is sometimes to get data out of papers, because sometimes it's published with the paper and sometimes it's not published with the paper and sometimes it's published in a paper and then the journal turned it into a PDF and then you can't really get the data out again, um, motivated us to create a, um, a database so we created um, a database. It's now sort of, I don't know, it's kind of in like alpha testing. We're loading data in. Uh, it's called MAVEDB. Uh, MAVE is uh, term multiplexed assays for variant effects. So deep mutational scanning is one type of multiplexed assay. Um, massively parallel reporter assays are, a, are um, a, an assay that uh, is used for, for regulatory elements, so the parts of the genome that turn other genes on and off. Um, it's a big open source project. Well, it's actually a pretty small open source project because it relies on some really wonderful big open source projects, specifically Django and Postgres, um, to kind of power the whole thing. Um, you can go there now. I think there's a data set in it, um, but you can, you can at least look at it. Um, we have two sets of target users for this. Um, so there's the experimenters. So these are the people who are, who are um, not, comp not very uh, computational. I mean, they're highly technical and incredibly skilled researchers. They don't really do a lot of, but they don't do software development. Um, and so they want to easily upload their entire data set. They want to get a stable accession number that they can put in their publication. So instead of having to figure out how am I going to format this Excel table and then upload it to the journal website, they can just say it's in MAVEDB and the accession number is this. Um, they want a flexible metadata scheme. They want to be able to put in information about their experimental methods and they want to get proper attribution when someone grabs their data and reanalyzes it. Uh, the other group is the modelers. This is the group that I identify with more strongly. Um, so we want to be able to easily download whole data sets, probably, possibly even the whole database, um, search by metadata, um, get the an experiment type, assay type, you know, give me everything that's you know, some, from some protein family or whatever. We also need stable accession numbers, and we want to be able to upload recomputed scores. We want to be able to put up, also put up our own detailed message descriptions when we create new scoring algorithms. Um, so it's set up with this sort of relationship. So we have experiments, which have the name of the target, authors, what was the wild type sequence, how was the assay done, any other sort of links out to the literature or other databases. Um, and then we have a score set, which is also has authors, which can be different authors, has a description of the method for how the scores were calculated. So this is the scores, the experiment is like the raw data. Um, and you have the scores and the counts and other things. But this is actually a one-to-many relationship, um, which means that if you come along with a new scoring method and you analyze some existing data set, it can be tightly coupled to the original data set. So the people that actually did that wet lab work 
can get proper credit, and we can also and we also don't have some weird double counting problem where you think that some benchmark data set has actually been analyzed, been performed 30 times, when really it's just the one that everybody reanalyzes to test their methods. Um, so this was all possible uh, because we use JSON fields in Postgres, and so we can actually be really flexible in terms of what columns we can include. Um, and, uh, and, and that is a kind of an expert feature that we didn't know about. And uh, so thanks to, to Nick Moore for, for telling me about that, um, which really made everything, this entire project possible. Um, so I think that's for those, for my fellow bioinformatics researchers in the audience, this is why you should come to LinuxConf is because you can meet people who know about weird stuff like this that we don't know about. And then you can actually do your project without it being really horrible. <laughs> um, so another thing that I think is really exciting that I just want to share briefly with this with you, because I think you may think it's really exciting too, is that there's a, there's a really rapidly expanding area of using machine learning in deep mutational scans. So this is from a paper that was published very recently, like I think a month ago, um, where they built a machine learning model to predict what happens if you do a deep mutational scan on a protein. So if you take a bunch of proteins, and you have a deep mutational scanning data and some other data about the protein, and you put that in your model and you train your model, and then you predict what's going to happen to if you scanned a protein that has never been scanned before, so that the model has or that the model hasn't seen before. It turns out that you do really pretty well. So this is just the predicted score versus the observed score. So that, considering like what we're dealing with and how complicated this field is, I think this is pretty amazing. And what's even more amazing is this is the performance as you increase the number of proteins. So they did seven, right? And there's probably, I think there's 68 or 70 of these experiments that have been published to date. There's probably another 30 in the pipe that are going to come out in the next six months. And this field is continuing to take off. So if we can continue to refine models like this and train them, and these proteins are all totally unrelated too, which is even more impressive. Um, I think we're really going to be able to make some huge progress in terms of predicting uh, what happened, or predicting the effect of all different parts of proteins, even parts of proteins where you may not have an assay. Um, so with that, uh, thank you all for, for, for being here and for listening. And uh, thank you to all of my, um, all of my collaborators, both uh, at WEHI and um, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And um, thanks to Nick for, uh, for telling me about Jason Fields. So um, that's it. Do we have any questions for Alan? Yes, uh, James has a question. So the question is, what are we putting in the HDF5 files? And the answer is, uh, we kind of put everything in there. So we have counts for each of the FASTQ files. And then the rows in the, in the HDF, basically there's a bunch of tables in each HDF5 file. And the rows are all the variants. And so we store count data across all the different FASTQ files. Then we also st store the scores standard deviations, all the, and all the intermediate values, all in different tables within the same HDF5 file. Do you have some kind of strategy towards compressing those HDF5 files, or does that not, not come up? Is there a strategy for compressing the HDF5 files? Um, no. I mean, I just, it just does whatever compression it does. Um, in practice, even if I you know, go and use a different tool that compresses the HDF5 file, it doesn't really do a whole lot. Part of the reason for that is probably because when I write the HDF5 file, I specify that everything is an index data column because the program itself does a lot of retrieval from the HDF5 files. So that maybe limits the amount of compression that we can get. They get pretty big. They're like, um, you know, three to eight gigs a piece. But that's, but that's got absolutely everything in it. So it's very easy to go back and, and pull things out and make different visualizations of, of variants that you thought are interesting. OK, um, another question. Dennis has a question. So 
So MaveDB is just a repository for the score. So if you have analyzed a demutational scanning data set or other similar data set, then you can upload it and it will have all of the variants that were in that data set. And um, yeah, it's all, it's all open. So right now, um, if you create a record, you can upload it, you can uh, play around with it, and then it stays, and it stays private only to you and the other people that you specified. And then at, once you click publish, it freezes all of the scores and makes it publicly viewable. So it becomes a stable record. So we are in the process currently of populating it with published data sets. And um, we are hoping that we will be able to add enough value that people want to put their unpublished stuff in there too and refer to it in their publication. I'd say in the beginning, it's going to be mostly a resource for people who are doing modeling who just don't want to have to scrape the supplementary data files from a whole bunch of papers. I've done that. It's it's uh, it's not great. Yes, we are we are on the same page. We can we can add a, a bunch of annotations and and really add value. The idea is that if if we can add annotations that are going to help people write their paper, then they're going to upload it when they start writing their paper, and and get some of that. Um, information. Yeah. Great. Um, other questions? Probably have time for one more. Maya? Sure. So, so where does CRISPR fit into all of this? So when you want to make your mutations, you can do it in a system that's sort of artificial, like in a bacteria cell or a yeast cell or a virus or something like that. And so you can you know, synthesize your DNA by, you know, ordering it from a company that synthesizes DNA, and you can order all the different, different flavors of molecule that you want, and you can put them in your system, and you can do that, and that's going to give you some really relevant biochemical information, but it's not what is happening when I do this inside a human cell, which is what we really want to know, especially for disease-associated proteins. So what you can do with CRISPR is you can use CRISPR to go in and edit the actual gene that is inside the cell in a cell line and then test it in human cells directly rather than needing to rather than needing to say well we did it in yeast and the proteins evolutionarily conserved so we learned some stuff but of course proteins are interacting with other proteins all the time and so having that full cellular context is really helpful right but yeah uh, crispr super exciting there's lots going on I think that's all we have time for. Cool. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much, Alan.